from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE, coming to you from our Palo Alto studios for the continuing coverage of KubeCon, Cloud NativeCon 2020, North America. There was the European version earlier in the summer. It's all virtual. Uh, so the good news is, is we don't have to get on planes and we can get guests from all over the world. And we're excited to welcome back for his return uh, to theCUBE, uh, Ricardo Rocha. He is a staff member and computing engineer at CERN. Ricardo, great to see you. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolutely, Pleasure. and you're coming in from uh, from Geneva, so you are you already had a good Thursday, I, I bet. Yeah, we're just finishing right now, yeah. Right, yeah. so in, in getting ready for this um, interview, I was looking at, at the interview that you did, I think it was two KubeCons ago uh, in May of 2019, and it just strikes me, a lot of people know what CERN is, but a lot of people don't know what CERN is. So I wonder if you can just give, you know, kind of the 101 of what CERN's mission is, and what is some of the work that you guys do there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so CERN is the European Organization for uh, Nuclear Research. Uh, we are uh, the largest particle physics laboratory in the world. And uh, our main mission is uh, fundamental research. So we try to answer big questions uh, about uh, um, why don't we see antimatter? Uh, what is dark matter or uh, dark energy? Um, other questions about the origin of the universe. And to answer these questions, we build very large machines, uh, particle accelerators, uh, where we try to recreate some of uh, the, the moments just after the universe uh, was created, the Big Bang, to try to understand better what was the state of the matter at that time. Uh, the result of all of this uh, is very often a lot of data that has to be analyzed, and that's why we traditional have had uh, huge requirements for computing resources uh, um, during the, the start of CERN, we always had this this large, large requirements. Right, and so you have this large particle accelerators, as you said, large machines. The one that you've got now, the, the latest one, how long has that one been operational? Yeah, so it started uh, like maybe around 10 years ago. Uh, the first launch was a bit before that. Uh, and it's uh, it's a very large, uh, it's the largest one ever built. So it's 27 kilometers in perimeter. We inject uh, protons in two different uh, directions and then we, tr we make them collide where we build these huge detectors that can, can see what's happening in these collisions. Uh, the, 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 main, the main particle accelerator is this one. We do have other experiments. We have a, an antimatter factory that is just uh, down from my office and we have other types of uh, experiments as well going right. on. Right, 27 kilometers. That's a big, yeah. That's a big number. And then, and then again, just so people get some type of sense of scale. So then you, you, you speed up the particles, you smash them together, yeah. you see what happens and collect all the data. What types of data sets are generated off, off just a one you know, kind of event? And I don't even know if that's a relative, you know, if that's a valid measure. How do, how do you measure kind of quantities of yeah. data around event? Just you know, kind of for orders of magnitude. Right, so uh, the way it works is, as you said, we accelerate uh, the particles to very close to the speed of light and we increase the energy by, by having the beams well controlled. And then at specific points, we make them collide. We have these gigantic detectors underground. All of this is 100 meters underground. And these detectors are pretty much a, a very large camera uh, that would take something like 40 million pictures a second. And the result of this is a huge amount of data. Uh, each of these detectors can generate up to one petabyte of second. This is not something we can record. So what we do is we have uh, hardware filters that will bring this down to something we can manage, which is in the order of uh, a few tens of gigabytes per second. Wow, so you've, been, you've got a very serious computing challenge uh, ahead of you, because you're the one that's on the hook for, for grabbing the data, recording the data, making the data available for, for people to use um, on their experiments. Um, so we're here at, at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. Where did containers come into the story, uh, and, and Kubernetes specifically? What was the real uh, challenge that you were trying to overcome? Yeah, so, uh... This is a, a, a long story of uh, using distributed computing at CERN and other types of uh, computing. Uh, so as I mentioned, we generate a lot of data. We generate something like seven peta 70 petabytes of uh, data every year. Uh, and uh, we've accumulated something over one, half an exabyte of data uh, by now. So 
traditionally, we've had to build this software ourselves, um, which was uh, because there was not so many people around that would have this kind of needs. But this uh, revolution with containers and the clouds appearing uh, kind of uh, allowed us to to join uh, other other communities uh, and uh, benefit also from their work and not have to do everything ourselves. So this is the main uh, uh, pro for us uh, to start doing this. The other point is more containerization. Uh, we traditionally are a very, um, uh, we have a lot of need to share information, but also share resources uh, between physicists and, uh, and engineers. So this idea of containerizing the work, including all the code, all the data, and then sharing this with uh, our colleagues is, is very appealing. Uh, the fact that we can also take this unit of work and just uh, deploy it in any infrastructure that has a standardized API like Kubernetes and scale that, monitor in the same way, it's also very appealing. So all of these things kind of uh, connect with our way of working, our natural way of working, I would say. Right, so you've talked about the, this upgrade is coming um, to the particle accelerator in a couple, four or five years, whatever that timeline is, relatively soon. Um, this, as you've said before, is a huge step function uh, in the data that's, that, that's going to come off these experiments. I mean, how are you keeping up on the compute side with the fundamental shift in on kind of the physics side and the data that's going to be generated to make sure that you can keep up? And I think you said it in a, in a prior interview somewhere along the way that you know you don't want to be the bottleneck when there's all this right. great work being done, but if it's not captured and made available for people to do stuff with the data, then you know it's not uh, it's not the greatest experiment. So how are you keeping up, and and what's the relative scale to have what you got to do on the compute side to keep up with the the guys on the physics side? Yeah. So the 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 idea well we will, what we will have to deal with is uh, an increase of ten times of uh, more data than we have today. We already have a lot, and very soon we'll have uh, a lot more. But this is not, the, I would say this is not the first time this kind of uh, step happens uh, in our computing. Uh, we always uh, kind of found a new technology or a new way to do things that would improve. In, in this case, uh, what we do is we do what we always do, which is we try to look for all sorts of new technologies or all sorts of new resources that we could make use of. Uh, in this case, uh, a lot is involving um, improving our own software um, to replace what we currently use with uh, hardware triggers, to replace that with software based uh, using accelerators, GPUs and other types of accelerators. This will play a big role and also making our software more efficient in this way. The second thing that we are doing is trying to make uh, our infrastructure more agile. And this is where cloud native Kubernetes plays a huge role so that we can uh, benefit from external resources. Uh, we, we can always think of uh, like expanding our in, in on-premises resources, but it's also very good to be able to just uh, go and fish around if there's something available uh, externally. Uh, Kubernetes plays a very big role in that uh, uh, respect as well. Yeah, I'd love to dig into that a little deeper because the Cloud Native Foundation is a super active uh, foundation, obviously a ton of activity around Kubernetes. So what does that mean to you as an infrastructure a provider, you know, to your own company being on the hook to have now, you know, kind of an open source community that's supporting you indirectly via ongoing developments and ongoing projects and having, as you said, kind of this broader uh, group of brain power uh, to pull from to help you move your own infrastructure along. Yeah, I think this this is great. Uh, we, we've had really good experiences in the past. Uh, we, we've been uh, heavy users of uh, uh, Linux from, from from a, for a very long time, we've used OpenStack for our private cloud, and we've been heavily involved in that uh, community as well. We not only uh, contribute as end users, but we also uh, offer some some manpower for development uh, and uh, helping with the community. And we are doing the same with Kubernetes. Uh, and this is uh, this is really we, we we end up getting a lot more than we we are putting in the community. We are quite involved, but uh, the, it's so large and, and and with such big players that have very similar needs to ours that uh, we end up uh, having a lot uh, a lot more back than we are putting in. Uh, we try to help as much as possible, but uh, yeah, we right. have limited resources as well. 
No, open source is an amazing, it's just an amazing innovation uh, machine. And, and obviously it's proved as its value over a lot of things from Linux to, to Kubernetes being one of the most recent. I want to shift gears a little bit, right? And ask you just your, your take on public cloud, right? One of the huge benefits of public cloud is, is the flexibility to add capacity, shrink capacity as you need it. And you talked again in a, in a prior thing I was looking at, you know, that you definitely have spikes uh, in demand spikes, yeah. whether there's a high frequency of, of experiments, I don't know how frequently you run those things, versus maybe um, a, a conference or something where you said people you know, want to get access to the data and run experiments prior to a conference. Do you, where does public cloud play in your thoughts? And maybe you're there today, maybe you're not. How do you think about you know, kind of public cloud ge uh, generically, but more specifically, you know, that ability to add a little bit more flex in your compute horsepower, or <laughs> are you just going up and to the right, up and to the right, and not really flexing down very much? Yeah, so this is, this is something we've been working on for a few years now. Uh, we, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I would say it's an ongoing work. It's a situation that will, will not uh, be very clear for the, for the next few years. But uh, again, what, what we try to do is just to explore as much as possible all kinds of resources that can help us. Uh, what we did in the KubeCon last year was this demonstration that we can actually scale, uh, we can scale out and burst for, for these uh, spiky workloads we have. We can burst to the, to the public cloud quite easily using this kind of uh, cloud native technologies that we have today. And this is extremely important because it kind of changes our mindset so instead of having to to think only on investing on premises, we can think that maybe we can cover for the majority of use cases, but then explore um, and burst to the public cloud. Uh, this has to be easy in terms of infra infrastructure, and that we are at that point right now with Kubernetes. We also have kind of workload that is maybe uh, easier to do these things than, than the traditional IT, where uh, services are very interconnected. In our case, we are more uh, thinking of batch workloads where we can just submit jobs uh, and then fetch the data back. Right. Uh, this also has a few challenges, but but it's I would say it's it's easier than than the traditional IT service um, uh, deployments. Uh, the other aspect where the public cloud is also very interesting is um, for resources that we don't have in large quantities. So we have a very large farm for with CPUs. We have some GPUs. And it's very good to be able to explore these new accelerator technologies and maybe expand our uh, available pool of accelerators by going to the public cloud, maybe to use them, but also to validate to see which ones are best for our use cases and explore that option as well. It's not only general capacity, it's really like dedicated um, hardware that we might not even have ever, like we think of TPUs or IPUs. It's something that is very interesting that we can scale and, and just uh, go go use them in the public cloud. Yeah, that's a really interesting point because because the cloud providers are big enough now, right? That they're building all kind of specialized specialized servers, specialized uh, CPUs, specialized GPUs, DPUs is a new one I've heard. A data processing mm -hmm. unit, and as you said, there's FPGAs and all kinds of accelerators. So it is mm -hmm. a really rich uh, environment for, as you said, to do your experiments and find what the optimal solution is for whatever that particular workload is. But Ricardo, I want to shift gears a little bit as we come to the end of 2020, um, thankfully, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, as you look forward to 2021, I mean, clearly anticipating and starting to plan to get ready for your upgrade as a priority. I'm just curious, what are your other priorities and how does, you know, kind of the compute infrastructure in terms of an investment within CERN, you know, kind of rank with the investment around the physical things that you're building, the big machines, because without the compute, those other things really don't provide <laughs> much data. And I know those are, we always talk about how expensive the particle accelerators is, because it's an interesting number and it's mm -hmm. big, but you guys are a big piece of that as well. So what are your priorities looking forward to, uh, to 2021? Yeah, from from the compute side, I think we are keeping the the priorities in in similar to what we've been doing in the last few years, which is uh, to make sure that uh, we we improve all our automation, uh, to improve efficiency as well, to prepare for these upgrades we have, uh, but also. Uh, there's a lot of activity in this new uh, area with machine learning popping up. Uh, we have 
ton of services uh, appearing where people want to, to start doing machine learning in many, many use cases. In some cases, they want to do the filtering in the detectors. In other cases, they want to generate uh, simulation data a lot faster using machine learning as well. So I think this will be something that will be a huge topic for next year, even for the next couple of years, which is to see how we can offer our users and physicists uh, the best uh, service um, so that they don't have to care about the infrastructure. They don't have to know about the details of how they scale their, their um, model training, their the serving of their models, all of this. I think this will be a very big to topic. Um, it's something that it's becoming really a big part of, uh, of the world computing uh, for high energy physics and for CERN as well. That's great, we, and we see that a lot, you know, just applied machine learning to very specific problems you talked about, you, you still can't even record all that information that comes off those things, you have to use some compression technology and other things, so yeah. real opportunities, we barely scratched on the surface of machine learning yeah. and AI, but I'm sure you're going to be using it a ton. Well, Ricardo, I'll give you, give you the last word. Um, we're in, at CNCF's uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. You know, what do you get out of these types of shows and, um, why is this such, again, kind of why is this such an important piece of your way you get your job done? Yeah, honestly, uh, after, with all this uh, situation right now, I kind of really miss this kind of conferences in person. Uh, it's really a huge opportunity to connect with uh, with uh, other end users, but also with, uh, with the community and to talk to the developers, discuss things over uh, coffee, beer. Uh, this is something that uh, is is really, um, something that is really useful to, to have these kind of meetings every year. Uh, I think what what uh, I always try to say is uh, this this wall infrastructure is is truly making a big impact uh, in the way we do things. So we can only thank the community. Uh, it's it allows us to to kind of shift uh, to focusing on a higher level to sh focus more on our use cases instead of ha having to focus so much on on the infrastructure. We kind of uh, start giving it as a given that the infrastructure scales and we can just uh, use it uh, and focus on optimizing our own software. So this is a huge contribution. We can only thank the CNCF project and everyone involved. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, that summary and that, that that's a terrific summary. So Ricardo, thank you so much for, for all your hard work, answering really big, helping answer really big questions and, uh, and for joining us today and sharing your insight. Thank you very much. All yeah. right. He's Ricardo, I'm Jeff, you're watching theCUBE from our Palo Alto studios for our continuing coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2020. Thanks for watching, see you next time.